I remember my former commander told me when I was stationed in Korea, it's your responsibility as an officer to know everything you can about what you're going to undertake. And uh, if you don't, that's a disservice to your soldiers. So as soon as I was told I was going to be deployed to Iraq, I started reading everything I can, um, trying to develop myself professionally. And so I, I read numerous articles um, by constitutional and international law experts um, saying basically that this war was unlawful by international and domestic standards. And also uh, I read many reports that came out from government uh, agencies, non-governmental agencies. And a lot of the accounts coming out from independent journalists, um, from the Iraqi people themselves, and from the soldiers who were coming back home from the war. And so that's why I've spoken out publicly. Um, spoken out against the misconduct going on within the highest levels of my chain of command uh, and also try to set the example um, for all members of the military that they need to evaluate the legality and the truthfulness behind every order uh, including the order to go to war and make the right decision regardless of, of the consequences um, and also to hopefully help end this war it is an illegal and unlawful war um, and my ultimate goal is to end it so that all members of the military can come back home and be with their families. This is Suki Sangera from Pepper Spray Productions, bringing you the full story on the mistrial of Lieutenant Aaron Watada, with commentary by Laura Dean. We have to realize that that laws aren't necessarily just, and authority isn't necessarily um, isn't right. And so, when that he he's acting out of integrity and he's acting out of his consciousness he's not just obeying orders because that's what you're supposed to do but he's really thinking about the implications of his potential actions and then acting upon that because we're such a we're such a society of lead and follow lead and follow lead and follow and so many of us are expected to follow all the times and sometimes we forget ourselves to think about what we're following and what we're doing and i think that's it's a wake-up call for America. Stop following and start leading and start thinking about what you're doing and the implications of your actions. We had our reporters at the gates of Fort Lewis. Good morning. We're here with Indy Media Presents to bring you the latest updates on the Lieutenant Watada Court Martial. I'm Randy Rowland for Pepper Spray Productions in the Seattle Independent Media Center. The crowds are starting to arrive at the gates of Fort Lewis. At the press conferences. Thank you all for coming. I hope you uh, enjoyed your introduction to military justice today. And inside the courtroom. This is Patricia Boyko for Indy Media here at the Lieutenant Watada Court Martial. We also obtained the sketches of the trial from courtroom artist Peter Millet. We are uniquely positioned to bring you this special pepper spray report on the court martial of Lieutenant Aaron Watada. Lieutenant Watada went into this trial facing four years in prison, one charge for missing movement for his refusal to deploy to Iraq, and two charges for conduct on becoming an officer for speeches he gave about his decision not to deploy to Iraq. Before the trial began, the prosecution dropped two years worth of additional charges in exchange for Lieutenant Watada stipulating to the facts that he refused an order to deploy to Iraq and that he indeed gave the speeches. This morning was all about uh, procedures. All they did was go over the motions, and then they took a very long time to go over uh, the stipulation. The fact that Aaron uh, stipulated to uh, having said those things doesn't mean that they're, they're a criminal, that there's a crime. The, the defense believes that uh, he had every right to say them, and that's really going to be one of the more contentious parts of the trial. Right. On the first day of Lieutenant Watada's scheduled court-martial trial, February 5, 2007, the judge systematically denied Watada's defense team the right to present a series of witnesses who would address the legality of the U.S. invasion and occupation of Iraq under international law. The judge was uh, denying uh, motion after motion. Every, almost every witness that the defense wanted to present was denied. Every motion uh, was denied. And uh, it's, it's obvious that, you know, it's going to be a battle throughout the week to actually try to win any victories in that court-martial. The defense was ready to bring in experts in international law, like Dennis Halliday, former Assistant Secretary General of the United Nations, to testify against the legality of the Iraq War. After the judge refused to allow any of these witnesses, many of them went on to testify at the War Tribunal held in Tacoma, Washington. The judge denied every defense motion and even prohibited the defense from arguing that Lieutenant Watada's speeches were protected under the First Amendment of the U.S. Constitution. 
By the time preliminary motions were over, Lieutenant Watata had been stripped of every possible defense. Outside the gates of the fort, a couple thousand people were chanting and singing and waving signs, but as the trial began, it wasn't looking too good for the lieutenant. So, so far today, they've uh, heard motions from both sides of the defense and the prosecution, um, and they so far have shot down uh, every testimony, every person who wanted to testify on behalf of Aaron, They've shot down every single one of them. The, yeah. So, you know, if originally they tried to, to, to say, you know, international law and introduce that as a reason why the war is illegal. So that's out. They're not even going to consider international law. Oh. Right. So now they're narrowing the testimony to see if they could get any support for Aaron in the courtroom, basically. And so, like I said, he denied all of them except potentially one. Um, they're considering very narrow testimony from Dr. Solis, um, and the judge is going to decide that when they come back from lunch break, which is going to happen pretty quick here. I think we have a, a military judge who knows full well that his career is on the line. That uh, you know, if uh, the, there's lots of pressure that's been brought by the Bush administration on um, the military, military justice, military lawyers. Uh, you have the judge advocate generals of the four military services who back in 2001, 2002 were slapped down by the Bush administration for daring to suggest that the Geneva Convention should apply to the people uh, taken from Afghanistan and other parts of the world. Uh, you have the military that was standing up saying habeas corpus ought to be uh, ought to apply to uh, the people that we've had in prison for five years, and it's the the Bush administration that's saying no, we we won't have it. So I have no doubts that there there is a lot of pressure on this this military court, but the the Bush administration doesn't want a first lieutenant to be able to argue the the uh, legality of the war in Iraq. They don't want that argued at all. Of course, Lieutenant Watata knew the odds when he decided to take his stand. He was an Eagle Scout who volunteered for the Army after 9-11, determined to do his duty for his country. The jury, as is common in a court-martial of an officer, was made up of a panel of seven Army officers, all of whom outranked Lieutenant Watata. Two were women. So the chances of uh, uh, quitting Watata not very good, you know, they're, they're actually, it's not going to happen. Um, that's not to say that we, we, won, we're, we're, uh, we can't win, because, you know, Aaron is facing two years in prison simply for uh, public comments, public speech, and there's every reason to believe that, uh, you know, we actually should win on those charges. If there's any justice, even following the law. The judge was Lieutenant Colonel John Head. Representing Lieutenant Watata in his defense were his Army-appointed military attorney, Captain Mark Kim, and his civilian attorney, Eric Seitz, who has been defending soldiers since the late 1960s. The Army prosecution, led by Captain Van Swearingen, assisted by Mark Brown, opened their case. As the first witness, the prosecution called Lieutenant Watata's immediate commander, Lieutenant Colonel Bruce Antonia, brought back from Iraq to testify. Lieutenant Colonel Antonia testified that Lieutenant Watata was a high caliber officer who had informed his superiors of his desire not to deploy to Iraq. He admitted that when Lieutenant Watata asked about the circumstances under which he could speak out against the war, the captain advised him that as long as his speeches were off base, out of uniform, and on his own time, which Lieutenant Watata's speeches were, he was free to speak his mind. The standard rule in the military between the duty of a soldier and the rights of a citizen is classically defined as off base, out of uniform, on your own time. That's the rules Lieutenant Watata's commander gave him, and Watata followed them. And when he spoke out publicly, he was acting under the impression that he was allowed to do that, among other reasons, because of the fact that he'd been given instructions about when he could speak out, and he adhered to all those instructions. And secondly, that when he failed to get on the plane, he believed, whether rightly or wrongly, that he was entitled to refuse that order because the war is illegal. The prosecution's second witness was Lieutenant Colonel William James, the next step in the chain of command above Lieutenant Colonel Antonia. 
Lieutenant Colonel James testified that Lieutenant Watada had also spoken with him about his concerns regarding the U.S. war in Iraq, but that as a career soldier and a man who understood military ways, he had tried to talk Watada out of taking a moral or ethical stand. He recounted the advice he gave to Lieutenant Watada, don't make a young man's mistake, don't throw your life away. Join the military not as a mercenary to go out there and do whatever you're told, right or wrong, and to go out and join the military and fight wars. And that's, that's not your only responsibility. Your responsibility when you took that oath is to the Constitution and not to a person. And that is, your oath is to protect and defend the Constitution, meaning America's laws and our values and our principles, against all enemies, foreign and domestic, which means the founders of, this, of the Constitution and the creators of that oath knew that there would be people within our own country who are threatening our liberties and our freedoms. And it was the responsibility of all Americans, and especially those in the military, um, to evaluate the legality of every order, to find out the whole truth, and not necessarily, it, it might be something that you don't want to believe, or that might be against what a whole bunch of your friends believe. Um, but that's your duty, and that's your oath, and that's why I think you joined the military. Here is an older career soldier telling the younger man who decided that democracy and truth were worth fighting for not to let his morals get in the way of his career. I signed uh, my papers when I joined the army in March of 2003 and if you, you can recall that was the invasion of Iraq. And uh, during the run up to it I think like many Americans out there, practically millions, we believed the administration when they said that Iraq had stockpiles. They guaranteed it practically on, on nation, um, national television. You, in, Colin Powell guaranteed it to the world um, at the UN that Iraq had weapons of mass destruction. They had the will and the intent to use it against their neighbors and the American people. And that Saddam Hussein had very strong ties to Al-Qaeda and he was responsible for 9-11. So I think like many people out there, I believed what I heard numerous and numerous times. Um, since then, I've come to believe, I've been convinced that this, uh, what they were telling us at that time, these premises for invading Iraq were false and that it was an intentional manipulation of intelligence um, around a policy that was already established prior to 9-11, prior to the, the invasion, uh, prior to any preparations for this war, uh, in order to get Congress and to authorize this war and, and to get the American people behind it. stand out here in support not only of his particular case, but of his moral position. What I believe is a, a mock court situation where the legality of the war has been thrown out as an issue when the very oath of office that he's uh, on trial for violating includes a, a commitment to international law and uh, in standing up against abuses of that, he's. Uh, more than likely going to be convicted. This war is unlawful. Um, what we're doing over there is unlawful. And that any order to force me to participate in that is unlawful as well. Uh, and I cannot, according to my oath, uh, violate that, my, my principles and take part in it. The prosecution had not done too well with their first two witnesses. To prove their case, they now went straight to the videotape of Lieutenant Watada's speech. I guess you could say uh, I'm a little overwhelmed by all the support I've been given, especially here tonight.
Thank you, everyone, very much. And thank you all for your tremendous support. How honored and delighted I am to be in the same room with you tonight. And yes, I am just an LT. <laughs> Yet, I feel as though we are all citizens of this great country, and what I have to say is not a matter of authority, but from one citizen to another. The video was the prosecution's evidence, but it was Watata's message. Enlisting in the military does not relinquish one's right to seek the truth, neither does it excuse one from rational thought, nor the ability to distinguish between right and wrong. I was only following orders is never an excuse. The Nuremberg trial showed America and the world that citizenry, as well as soldiers, have the unrelinquishable obligation to refuse complicity in the war crimes perpetrated by their government. The judge had tried to keep this message out of the courtroom, but there just isn't any way to convict a man of saying something wrong without showing what he said. The prosecution called their next witness, Professor Richard Swain, who they had lined up earlier in the proceedings as an expert to serve as a rebuttal witness against the defense's professor of military ethics. The judge had prevented the defense from bringing their own expert, but now agreed to let the prosecution bring the rebuttal witness in over Sight's objections. In Sight's cross-examination of Swain, he was able to bring up ethical questions about the core of Lieutenant Watada's stand and to make the point the defense had been trying to establish since before the trial began. It is a soldier's duty to disobey an illegal order. According to one reporter, bit by bit, defense counsel for the accused got the prosecution's witness to make Watata's case. And that was all the prosecution had, their last witness. It was not looking good for the army. The prosecution rested their case. The judge adjourned until the following day. Defense attorney Eric Seitz, forbidden a defense and witnesses, closed with the enemy and engaged the prosecution on its own turf. Even corporate media outlets who were in attendance were describing the prosecution's case as shabby. The morning of the third day of Lieutenant Watata's court martial, February 7th, the defense was due to begin their case. But out of the blue, the judge raised the issue of the stipulation which he had spent several hours reviewing before admitting it into evidence on the first day of the trial. That not only did Lieutenant Watada not misunderstand, I signed it, I did not misunderstand it. My co-counsel, my military co-counsel signed it and he didn't misunderstand it. General Dubik signed it and he did not misunderstand it. It was very clear what we were signing and why we were signing it and why it was drafted the way it was. And I will tell you additionally, the judge looked at that draft, and he went through it and offered suggestions for corrections before it was finalized and signed. Judge Head was suddenly concerned about Lieutenant Matata's rights. He said the stipulation wasn't a stipulation of facts, but rather was a confession of guilt. Lieutenant Watata's defense team disagreed, stood by the stipulation, and argued stridently that they had a right to present their case. Judge Head wanted the defense to move for a mistrial. Spectators in the courtroom say Eric Seitz turned his head just a little and grinned. The defense refused to ask for a mistrial and demanded to proceed. The prosecutor, Captain Van Swearingen, was sitting at his table with his face buried in his hands. The judge then demanded of the prosecutors Will the prosecution ask for a mistrial? The prosecutor, now standing behind his table, looked like he was about to cry. Captain Van Swearingen replied, no. He stated the prosecution wanted to proceed and also argued against calling a mistrial. Judge Head called a timeout. The prosecutor flinched and leaned forward like someone had hit him in the stomach. In the courtroom, the press and spectators were abuzz. What's going on, they whispered to each other. What's just happened? The talk of mistrial just didn't make any sense. When the judge called the court back into session, the prosecutor, standing at attention, good soldier that he is, obediently motioned for a mistrial. Judge had declared a mistrial, and it was all over. Good afternoon. First, I 
want you to understand that a mistrial in the case of this significance is a very rare occurrence. And when it happens, it has potentially very significant effects. In this case, it is my professional opinion that Lieutenant Watada cannot be tried again because of the effect of double jeopardy. As you all know, we did not consent to a mistrial. We did not ask for a mistrial. We did nothing to warrant a mistrial. The judge made all of his rulings himself or based upon motions by the government. Once jeopardy has attached, and it clearly did attach in this case, when the jury panel was sworn in and when the first witness testified, the protection against double jeopardy applies as a constitutional matter. The doctrine of double jeopardy is drawn from the Constitution and is for the protection of the people. So that, as UW Law Professor John Junker noted, judges cannot just stop in the middle and say, I don't like the way it's going, and start over. Double jeopardy is never a strategy by a defense counsel. However, when things begin to go badly for the government in a case, it is always something that defense counsel have to be wary about that someone will cause a mistrial to occur in able to resurrect a case which isn't going too well. The prosecution threw their best shot at Watada and based on their case alone, Lieutenant Colonel Judge Head was scared into pulling the plug on Lieutenant Watada's trial. We did nothing. We just basically entered into an agreement to stipulate to what the government drafted. And the, the judge can say whatever he wants, but that's untrue. We are blameless in this situation. We have been entirely consistent throughout this. We entered into a stipulation which we signed, which was drafted by the government, and we stand by that stipulation and everything that it says in it. CourageToResist.org declared the Lieutenant Watada mistrial a resounding and clear victory. The government doesn't get endless tries at a defendant until their lawyers and witnesses get it right. They rested their case and that's the only shot they should get at Lieutenant Watada. Just weeks after the mistrial, the Army refiled charges against Lieutenant Aaron Watada, scheduling a second court-martial hearing to begin July 16th with pre-trial motions set for May 20th. Eric cites plans to file motions by April seeking to have the charges dismissed due to double jeopardy. Should the defense lose on all motions to dismiss, and this case goes back to be tried all over again, we can only expect even bigger fireworks to come. This is Suki Sangera and Laura Dean for Pepper Spray Productions and the Seattle Independent Media Center. And they all against war Sir, no sir, we won't take it anymore Now they're mixing with the people Getting nice on the floor Young America, had a character Tearing down the clear channels I'm it down, bury y'all Looking for a fix they never find in the mix Why the DJs always play the same six? Love, sex, drugs, thugs Nothing about the NSA getting phones bugged They can't handle it when I dismantle it Two turntables and a mic set to damage it Getting the people in the streets like damn Revolutionaries must have brought their whole fam All they hubris left them clueless Now throw your fists up so we can show them what the truth is No justice, no sleep The farmer's gonna weep when it comes time to reap Getting big money, play for your time's up Where the activists, where the unions Fist up, get them high, get them high If you ain't selling out, then reach for the sky Word is born Let that jam rock all night long Word is born That's my song Let that jam rock all night long Fist up, get them high, get them high If you ain't selling out, then reach for the sky Word is born That's my song Let that jam rock all night long let that jam rock all night long. Word is born. That's my song. One vet, two vet, three vet, four. Back from Iraq and they all against war. Yeah.
corporate media is often criticized for only going after the spectacular shots and the superficial stories and not bothering with the issues raised by demonstrators. Truth is, they don't even get the good shots. Crowbars and even their bare hands broke them and threw the chunks at the lines of riot police. Get the fuck out of here. For the good shots, as well as the whole truth and the reasons behind the truth, rely on the independent media. Hey.